Dracula, a popular book written by Bram Stoker in 1897. It is loosely based on the tyrannical ruler Vlad the Impaler who held the title of Dracula in the event that he had survived and became a menacing vampire. The popularity of Dracula has exploded into different mediums from many 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 different movie adaptations to plays and of course video games, the Castlevania series. As such, welcome to Castlevania 101 Part 2, where we explore the whole history of Castlevania. And today we're going to talk about the sequel 8-bit Castlevania NES games. As we originally saw in the last part, there were three different versions of Castlevania 1. Yes, I know about those PC ones, but those are just shitty ports of the NES game, so I didn't even bother. And I'm not going to include these two. Yet. After finishing Castlevania 1, the development team decided to go on to working on a sequel, considering its amazing success on the NES. So yes, so long MSX, I hope to never have to play another keyboard Castlevania with no continues again. Konami was on a roll with a pretty strong franchise that was starting to define them with the likes of Mario, Zelda, and Mega Man. The sequel as such looked like a big deal, and even got badass artwork like this one on Nintendo Power that caused a lot of controversy. <laughs> Oy, how I missed the old, cool, ballsy Konami instead of this new, dickwardly ballsy Konami. <sighs> now we're gonna move on to Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. What's interesting here, however, is the fact that we're actually moving backwards here, as this was actually made before the atrocity that was known as Haunted Castle and after Vampire Killer. Oh god. So the story of Castlevania 2 takes place seven years after Simon Belmont defeated Dracula in the original game. But right before Dracula died, the asshole himself placed a curse, or cancer, whichever way you want to call it, on Simon that would slowly kill him over the years. So yeah, just like Cancer. With how Dracula's minions are starting to appear again, Simon as such decided to take up his whip, the Vampire Killer, to collect Dracula's body parts in order to kill him again and remove the curse off him. Or Simon is just making a complete guess and he could be wrong, but he's dying, so he may as well try after all. Well, time to start the game and I really miss using this controller so much, as the controls for the last the game were horrendous. So starting off, we are presented to a pretty generic opening screen. Sure, it's still the film reel, but it looks so generic compared to the first games. But we're in the game, and this is different. No one's trying to kill me. Am I playing the right game? Is this Zelda 2? I'm in a town here, and I can talk to people apparently. Well, no one's giving me any real hints as to where to go, so let's try this left path and ow. Okay, not that path. Let's try the other path and here we go. So in case you haven't noticed, this is the series' second crack at doing a Metroidvania game. It contains multiple different paths and a completely interconnected map that's required to explore in order to complete the game. However, the game does it much better than Vampire Killer. It takes that sweet engine from Castlevania 1 with a nice hitbox and style and combines it with a Metroidvania formula. And you know what? It's actually pretty fun. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but it's still the classics of action and platforming. I don't even guess what those people in like ABGN were on when they played. Alright. Nighttime! So welcome to the horrendous nights of Castlevania 2. Everything is bullshit hard, dealing double damage and takes twice as much hits to kill an enemy. You can't even access anyone or any houses in town during that time. So you're low in health, you better survive the night in order to heal at the church during the day. And that's the thing, while the game isn't the same bullshit that Vampire Killer and Haunted Castle were with their death cycles of no continues, this game simply respawns you around the same place, but you lose all your hearts. You may think, well that's no big deal as I don't care about using sub-weapons. Well newsflash, hearts represent currency in this game. So hearts in the first game didn't represent health, but rather ammunition and now they represent money? Like what? It doesn't make sense anymore. 
Now currency is a huge issue in this game as you have to buy a lot in this game. Whip upgrades that you need in order to just pass otherwise ridiculous enemies. Key items like the crystals that you need to progress on and other major items. If you die, you lose all your hearts and you have to go hunting for them all over again. Also, there are no candles in this game, so the only way to get hearts are to fight enemies and enemies at night only give you a decent amount of hearts too. So while you could simply wait out in a safe corner at night for the night to pass so you don't have to deal with those bullshit tough enemies, you should in fact be killing those same bullshit tough enemies just to make a decent amount of money. So yes, the game is giving you a fuck you and has its foot up your ass at the same time as you have to fight tough enemies in harder conditions while trying not to die with all those hearts in place. Sure, you get 3 lives before you lose all your hearts, but when you finish a dungeon, you might only have 1 life left and 100 hearts at the same time, so that is when it's a truly scary moment of survival. Right, so let's talk about the dungeons. So, throughout the game, there are 5 dungeons which house each of the pieces of Dracula. These are more akin to the traditional Castlevania levels from the first game, except they're not so linear this time. Like here's the first dungeon! Now how am I supposed to go up there? I know this game is non-linear, but is this not the first place I'm supposed to be? Like, what am I supposed to do? What? Wait a minute. How am I going up on my own? Well, it seems by having the white crystal you get in the first town, it lets you see this invisible platform which I would not have known without jumping like an idiot. And that's the thing, the game is very vague. I mean, I was thrown in the middle of the town, talked to a few people, and had no idea what they were on, and went on and later got some hearts and realized I did need a white crystal and went all the way back just to get it. Apparently there was a guy at the start that tells you about it. Off to the very corner that is. Seriously, this is Castlevania. I'm used to being thrown into the action and just moving forward to combat and jump. Not trying to decipher the Rosetta Stone. So, back to dungeons, the issue becomes very clear that even if this part is like Castlevania 1, it is much worse. There are invisible blocks everywhere, and there isn't any hint as to the fact that they're invisible. They look like any other block, but you fall right through them, and you got to climb all the way back up again. It's as if they are artificially trying to lengthen the game this way. Alright, at the end of a dungeon, and no boss! What? Well, this is anticlimactic. In the meantime, let's look up that remake of Castlevania 1 in Unreal Engine, mind you. This is anticlimactic. So yeah, we get to the room with Dracula's body part, and it's covered in an orb. How do I open this shit? Well, apparently you need to find a merchant in this place that sells you an oak steak. What the hell is an oak steak even? And why are merchants literally living in a dungeon full of monsters? Were they literally waiting 7 years just for someone to come in hopes of just... 50 hearts? Well, wow, I don't feel so bad anymore, as I feel actually bad for him. As I feel that I've ripped him off. But I feel more ripped off as I feel like I'm wasting my time when I could just simply be replaying Castlevania 1 instead of this. So yeah, we now got Dracula's Rib, which gives you this neat looking shield from Vampire Killer. Yes, that game did have one nice thing. Also, I do wonder, why was Dracula's body torn apart like that? From what I remember in the Dracula mythos, all you need to do is stab him in the heart and cut his head off. No wonder Simon was dressed up like Conan the Barbarian in the first game. Upon getting the body part, you're not even transported back outside Zelda style. You gotta go through all this crap just to get out. Why? Cuz bullshit. Later on, as I book it back to the first town cuz I'm on my final life and I'm hoping not to die from the horrible night, I end up buying holy water and fuck, this thing is amazing, just like it was in Castlevania 1. It not only assists me in stopping enemies in the tracks and makes the game not as tough even at night, but I can also throw this down repeatedly on the ground to see where the invisible blocks are even. I guess the only real downside to this is that it doesn't have the nice flame effect that it used to have. Wait, why do these fucking bones from enemies have that flame effect, but the obvious holy water doesn't anymore? 
Well, sadly, holy water isn't as nice as you may have just thought, as you soon encounter crap like this spider here, which you can't holy water, and it shoots at a very long range. I mean, seriously, this is terrible with how I'm getting attacked from all sides. Ugh. Of course, that's only one path. The other path in this metroidvania takes you to these eyeball thingies that even with holy water, it is still quite difficult to defeat. So you soon make it to this town that seems to have no churches and no one is in these houses. Odd. Well, next town. Same thing. What is the point of these towns? Well, there's this guy who wants your white crystal in exchange for a blue one and... Well, he just grabbed it without permission. Um, okay. So now where do I go? Well, there's this lake here. I'm assuming that I have to cross the lake here, but do I use the blue orb since it's blue? Nah, that's too stupid. That's just too stupid, and this game's too stupid. Ugh. I mean, there's this whole land below it, and yet the water is still standing there. So it's not like the water was drained. Why is this game so stupid? Anyways, here's the easier second dungeon. Which the only thing about it I want to say is, wow, these spikes take more than half your life. So at this point, I've explored everything I can in the east, and I can't seem to find where to go. I mean, the left path in the first town is now doable with my stronger whip plus holy water, but I can't get past this poison. People here in this far off town are telling me that I need something called a laurel to get past there, and being told also to buy garlic for some reason. But I have no idea where. I have literally checked every house and talked to every person, but I can't find a single merchant. Alright, time to do what I hate best. Hit up Game Facts, cause fact this game! Alright, let's see here. Apparently it's telling me that I can buy them in the shop in these very towns that told me to buy garlic and laurel, but I don't see where. And suddenly the answer is... <sighs> Remember all those houses that were empty earlier? Well, you have to holy water the floor or the side walls to find the merchants that are hidden there. I think this game is actually making me dumber. But I'm trying to remember that I'm not actually a dumber person by watching this movie, as Konami may want me to be. You know, it doesn't even make sense here. Why would a merchant who is trying to make money conceal himself behind a wall or a floor? This is terrible for business. Like, what the flying fuck? The worst part is that I'm now seeing that there's a lot of shit to buy here, which includes a much needed whip upgrade. And so, this is what this game seems to be about. Not about the action or adventure, but grinding for hearts. Hearts that I now need to buy all this shit. I even now welcome the horrible night, just so I could make much more money off those strong foes. Well, this is quite a reflection as a millennial, as a lot of what we do try to do is try to make a living, and a lot of the feasible jobs are also at night. So yeah, after getting all the stuff and crossing the poison, you reach this boatman, who can cross you over. Sure, I'll take you to a good place. <laughs> hmm, what he says is suspicious, but he's safely taken me to land, so screw over thinking this. Well, after you pass a town which has some seriously thirsty women, and seeing a woman who references the Death Star. Wait, hold up! The Death Star? I mean, I get Star Wars was studied to take place a long time ago. But I guess that time clearly was 1698. And that clears out one of my life goals. So yeah, afterwards we get to this infamous wall. If some of you don't know, this is the wall that was seen in that old AVGN video. I mean, I didn't see anyone in the game telling you that you have to hold this red crystal and kneel down to warp from here. I literally had to use my knowledge from that old AVGN video to even know how to do this. Well, next dungeon. And I've already hit a dead end, which looks like the game might be pretty stupid yet again as it made another pointless path. But suddenly we're at the orb with the relic. But I've got no oak steak. But suddenly there's the merchant. Standing off screen for some reason. 
So yes, remember that dead end? You were supposed to destroy that wall and hop over it, and get him to buy that oak steak. I mean, hidden paths are used usually for bonus things in games, but here it is just horribly abused. Of course, the game is horribly cryptic too, so why does this surprise me anymore? Now outside, after all this crap that I've went through, comes this merchant, who upgrades my whip into a fucking fire whip. I mean, I've went through a lot in this game, but fuck, this is so badass! It's so badass that a fire enemy even dies to a more badass piece of fire. And wow, already another dungeon, which has surprisingly a boss fight! Finally a boss fight, which I could skip! Why is everything in this game so freaking anticlimactic? Ah, screw this shit, I'm fighting him. And it's still anticlimactic, as he's too fucking easy for a Castlevania boss. Well, we're done with that dungeon. Now where to? Well, this leads back to that old graveyard in the right path, meaning I came full circle. So where the hell do I go to now? From what I remember, there's only five relics in this game, but I've got four of them. So, there's one more out there, but where could it be? I've explored everything. Sure, I'll take you Wait to a Wait a place. minute. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. Okay, I should calm down. I really should calm down. I mean, after all, last time... I punched a hole in this wall, and I did this patch job here, which isn't very good. And I don't want that to happen to the rest of this room. Um, so I'll just keep it inside, and I'll just uh, recover with some wall meat that's still inside of there. What the? Dear Obsessive Gamer, I noticed that there was some wall meat unguarded here. Sincerely, Simon Belmont. So yeah, it seems just because I hadn't had Dracula's heart equipped, he took me to the wrong path that made me skip over one dungeon. There was no one hinting at me that I was required to have the heart selected. I thought simply having it was enough. It's not like I can even backtrack back there, as I was warped from the mountain. I literally have to go through this graveyard and all the way back to that ferryman again. Finally at the dungeon! <laughs> it's a pretty straightforward dungeon, but yes, it has a boss battle, and it is death himself. But, no, I'm not skipping this, as I'm in an ass-kicking mood after all this. However, what is this shit? Remember Death in Castlevania 1, who was virtually one of the toughest bosses in the series with his ruthless amount of sight that he threw at you? All he does now is shoot one and move slowly. I have said anticlimactic so much that it's losing all meaning at this point. With that whole backtracking I just did, I do wonder if that is actually intentional and this dungeon is supposed to be the last one, as death is usually the battle right before Dracula. But with how easy the enemies are here, I'm gonna go with a no and this game just simply fucked me up. Well, we're finally on the road to Dracula, which leads us to this town where everyone hates you. Well, excuse me for killing off Dracula back then and freeing you guys off his tyranny and evil ways. It's not like I'm dying or anything as a result of sticking up for you assholes. Continuing on... At last, Dracula's castle! Final dungeon time, and... Right, I destroyed it in the last game. Okay, I take back a lot of the stuff I said about many other things being anticlimactic, as this takes the cake. This is supposed to be Dracula's castle and the final dungeon, but there's nothing here. Not even any platforming challenges. So once in the boss room, the body parts of Dracula come together, and comes death. But I thought this was death, but this guy also looks like death. 
and I thought I'm fighting Dracula. Why does nothing make sense? I mean, he's even throwing scythes like death. Was this a scrap death battle? I mean, he's even out deathing death. However, Dracula is super easy. You can spam pillars of fire and he's quickly dead as it keeps him from moving. Or you can just simply throw a lot of daggers at him and he simply dies. Or if you want to go no items, you can stand to the side and just whip him repeatedly until he's dead. Wow, so this is what it came down to. I fought a badass dragon battle in the last game at the end after ripping his head off, but here I'm fighting a cheap knockoff of death called Dracula, who barely puts up a fight. Finally, we are at the credits that say that the people will be grateful to Simon. Yeah, as grateful as they were when he first defeated Dracula. Well, we're finally done this game. <sighs> I just don't understand. The game has good music like Bloody Tears, some nice platforming and combat, but the game is so chock full of problems that it really hurts it. In fact, the game heavily reminds me of Zelda 2 from going to villages to how much it differs from the first game. In fact, the game came out in the same year as Zelda 2. I really wonder if they intentionally decided to copy that game since that game came out first in fact. Which is an odd choice as that is the game that is considered the black sheep of the Zelda games and the game Miyamoto doesn't even like. But is it really a bad game? I honestly can say no. It really isn't actually a bad game. You may hear a lot of people say that it is indeed a bad game, which from what I've experienced, a lot of people are actually repeating AVGN's claim to fame as their source. But some do legit not like the game. The game is still enjoyable in my opinion, but it just doesn't hold up to the level the Castlevania 1 was, but it still has fun platforming action and music. Just use a guide all the way through if you want to have fun though. And with that... It's dark, and from what I remember, Things are a lot tougher in the dark, and so it's time for Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse. After two bad and one mediocre Castlevania game, the team, who weren't responsible for the atrocious haunted castle and vampire killer, finally decided to go back to what made Castlevania 1 amazing and improve upon it. Thus came out Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse. Instead of continuing the story of Simon Belmont, the team decided to instead make this a prequel based on Simon Belmont's ancestor, Trevor Belmont. Just as you start the game, you see the film reel going down, flickering much better already than the Castlevania 2 generic opening. The story geniusly takes place in 1476, right around the time the historical Vlad the Impaler's real-life death happened which, based on this, is when Dracula had just become a vampire. Don't worry, Castlevania fans, I'll plan to talk about Lament of Innocence one day. With Dracula spreading his evil and tyranny throughout Europe, the once exiled Belmont family who were feared for their superhuman strength were called in by the church to defeat Dracula. For an S game, that's in my opinion a rather nice setup to a story. Genius, I would say, with how nicely they are trying to tie it to Vlad the Impaler here too. Anyways, the game doesn't just put you in the shoes of the whip-wielding Trevor Belmont, but three other characters too. They include the famous and beloved Alucard, who is the son of Dracula, based on the Alucard from the film Son of Dracula, down to its design even which you may hear a lot about later in the scheduled Castlevania 101s. Next is Grant Dynasty, whose name is based on the noble house of Dynasty of Valachia, Valachia being where Transylvania is located. And Sifa is based on syphilis, I mean, possibly on the word cipher, since her true nature is hidden. But enough of that, have at you! You should have saved that line for Symphony of the Night! Ow, my eye! As stated before, welcome back to True Castlevania. I have missed this stuff so much after not playing the traditional stuff after three games. 
The amazing straightforward level structure is back. Nothing like Castlevania 2's cryptic shit. Combat is back to a simple yet challenging system again with good hit detection. And platforming is here again and worth something. And wow, the music. While Vampire Killer and Haunted Castle mostly used remixes of Castlevania 1's track, Castlevania 2 only had one good track known as Bloody Tears. This game, however, is jam-packed with many new and amazing music tracks too, both just as powerful and driving. It's like the dev team went, let's pretend we're making more levels for Castlevania 1. However, while Castlevania 1 is a tough game, this is the game that makes you think Castlevania was just a police academy, while this is the fucking military you are in. Like, remember Medusa heads and how tough they were when just trying to go through a hallway or platforming to dodge them? Well, they are back, but it's now tougher. They haven't changed, but the game design has made them harder. You may face them on various tough platforms now, from on top of spikes you could trigger by jumping on, to fucking stairs. The stairs are a nightmare. You can't jump, your speed is terrible, and the stairs go on for a while. So a Medusa is coming at you is a very hard thing to deal with. What's worse is that we now face a foe worse than the Medusa head. I like to call these guys Evolved Medusa Heads. They at first start to swivel like Medusas, but then take two large swivels at the end. They are, as such, harder to track and basically Medusa Heads on crack. Remember how Metroids and Metroid 2 were only a base form and had these evolved forms that were much tougher? Well, I like to think of these guys as the evolved Medusa heads coming at you now. What's worse is that you face them mostly on stairs too. <sighs> Other than stairs, the level design is much tougher too now. General horror platforming, like trying to jump off this teetering platform to the other side, or levels that literally slide upwards. If you are caught at the bottom, you are dead, and that literally makes no sense why it happens. Is the tower collapsing? I mean, I guess I'll buy that. But then, why does it slide downwards and stuff upwards in this one stage? To top that off, due to the Ness's limitations, the enemies don't spawn until the next section is loaded. So if I go to this upward platform, before the screen scrolls up or down, an enemy might pop up and hurt you. Let alone, the game at times throws multiple bosses at you, like here you have to face three bosses, one after another, each with their own HP bar. In the original Castlevania 1, that was unheard of. However, as stated earlier, you get to play as other characters too. The first character you meet is Grant, who is a pirate looking guy who uses a knife. However, he's amazing. He can stick to walls and using that, you can take nice shortcuts to escape these death traps as such. Take that cheap level design. Let alone he's a high jumper and fast hitter. For example, here's this boss battle over here. It's a tough fight with Trevor as I can't jump over him to dodge him. But as Grant, I can jump over him easily and giving him a quick stab to the face before moving back makes for an excellent strategy. The game also carries split paths now, which is a nice touch as it gives you more reason to replay the game now, as you can experience new levels that you may have not tried before. Later on, you encounter Sifa, the second of the other characters you can use. However, in exchange, you have to sadly give up Grant. But it's so worth it. While you lose the ability to climb walls or jump high, Sifa has magic. Fire magic can sweep projectiles and hit enemies hard. Her ice magic can freeze almost any enemy in their tracks, including projectiles, and then all she has to do is break them with one hit of her staff. Fuck, it even freezes water so you can cross it easily rather than fight the stream that comes otherwise. Her staff may not be as strong as Trevor's whip, but it's very fast and as such excellent for getting rid of quick enemies like fleamen, crows and even projectiles by spamming the attack button. Let alone in combination with Trevor, she works very well. 
for quick kills and getting rid of projectiles, Sifa. For precise hits on the head, for example, Trevor. I mean, sure, I miss Grant at this point, as I now can't get to a lot of places that I could with him, but the trade-off is so worth it. I mean, why are you so good, Sifa? As you may have noticed, we've been outside the whole time in forests and other places, but now comes what we've been waiting for. Dracula's Castle. It is so refreshing to see it alive again, unlike the disappointment that was Castlevania II's Dracula's Castle. I mean, the entrance looks like the first games again, complete with a remix of Vampire Killer. It only feels right to play as Trevor here, even as much as I would love to play as Waifu, I mean Sifa over here. So here's the hallway we're crossing right now. With how windy it is, I'm almost expecting Medusa heads to pop up. And this hallway does look very familiar, but now it makes sense why it looks familiar. We're at the boss battle with death. I do wonder, however, is this the same Medusa hallway from the first game? As you do end up at death by the end of it. Either ways, death is a tough battle again, unlike how disappointing he was in the second game. Multiple scythes are back, and he's faster again. And of course, I die as Trevor. Hmm, what if I try to use Sifa here? Well, before that fight, let's walk up and bust a few candles first, and whoa, what's this new spell? Oh my god, this is amazing! Just when I thought Sifa was amazing, she only got even more amazing with a broken homing attack. She even is already obliterating death! But wait, death in this game has a second form. He's as ruthless as ever, but Sifa is even more ruthless, as a second form also doesn't stand a chance here. These homing projectiles are amazing. Even against those evolved Medusas on stairs, it is now easy to deal with, as these spells simply home in on them, and as well, kills other threats around you as well. Now what's this, boss? I am a shadow, the true self. You tell people your name is Trevor, but in fact, it is Ralph, but are too ashamed of it because you don't want to be name-called into Ralph Belmont Wiggum. No, you're wrong! You aren't me! <laughs> Alright, final level before Dracula, which definitely is tougher with this bullshit ceiling lowering crap and soon requiring you to swing on these pendulums. I mean, wow, this clock platforming is tough. You think the clock has just stopped far enough that you can jump, but no, you have to wait just slightly longer against what looks reasonable just to be able to make that jump, let alone these pesky bats keep throwing you off. But finally, here we are, the Dracula fight. No more death ripoffs, a real tough Dracula battle. In this Dracula fight, he makes pillars of fire that surround you. The closer you are, the more closed in the pillars are. And soon afterwards, he launches another pillar right in the middle to hit you. So if you are too close, you have no room to dodge the middle pillar. As such, keep your distance far enough to dodge the middle pillar while being able to hit his head through the outer flame pillars. Granted, it may be much harder than it sounds, as one needs to maybe get used to the timing of the middle pillar too, which as such may lead to a quick death. Well, I wasn't expecting to be Dracula on my first try, but... Why am I back here again? In Castlevania 1, when you lose to Dracula, you start at the bottom of the staircase and you could simply just face him again. Here, they throw you all the way back at the last door, meaning you have to go through all these enemies and that bullshit swing platform all over again just to have another crack at him. And this is a tougher Dracula battle in the first stage, and yet they want you to go through all this again just to have another crack at him? Anyways, once you defeat Dracula, his second form pops up and this badass soundtrack pops up. You know shit's really going down now. This version of Dracula looks like it has multiple heads and thus multiple ways to target it. So the clear choice is the waifu's fire attack, which incinerates it very, very fast. But wait, if that almost seemed underwhelming for a final fight with that form, don't. You're now in for one really tough fight, a rare Dracula's third form. 
This fight is easily one of the toughest fights in the series. I would put it on the same tier as a death battle from Castlevania 1. He has only one weak spot on his head and you have to ride these platforms just to get close enough to hit him with your whip. Unless you have axes, which good for you, but I ran out so I had to start whipping Dracula. However, the fact that it is platforming is what makes it tough. Dracula fires these beams at you, so you have to dodge while riding these platforms. It's not just a fight against Dracula, but the whole design of the game coming in one from action to platforming. I want to say this is genius, but this is such a ridiculously tough battle and combined with having to start this whole level again, it gets really tedious. Well, as much as I'd love to beat this as a Belmont, just like how I love to beat my Mario games as Mario rather than Luigi, I might need to play a Seafire if I want to maybe beat this. And it does make a difference! While the platforming is still hard, Sifa's fire attack has a bigger range and it hits harder than Trevor's whip. As such, it now feels like a much fairer fight, even if it's still a tough fight. And Dracula is defeated! Not by the hands of a Belmont, but a Belmaid! And so, the overrated Belmont stands next to Sifa, who finally lets her hair out and seems to maybe get together with Trevor. Well, way to go! You got good taste, man! You definitely don't need to worry about her being kidnapped like Simon did in Haunted Castle. Well, that's Castlevania 3! It is so satisfying beating a game that hard. I'm forgetting something, aren't I? Wait, there was another character, wasn't there? Shit, Alucard, right! Um, But I just beat that game, um, do I dare play again? Yes, uh, I just can't leave this game incomplete. Well, apparently there was a split path in the game that you had to choose one leading to Sifa that I took earlier and one that eventually leads to Alucard. First off, this path is much harder. Like, the game was already harder than the first game while playing on that other path, but this one is basically punching you in the gut every little way. Platforms are much harder, enemy combinations are much rougher too. Ugh, low on health. There usually is some meat somewhere near the boss. Why can't I find it anywhere? This mode even is taking away the one thing that keeps me from pulling my hair out. Soon you reach Alucard, who, like Grant, appears as a boss fight first and fights a lot like his father in the first game. Well, maybe the difficulty of this path is justified because maybe Alucard is actually more broken strong than even Sifa. Yeah, that must be it. I mean, why else is Alucard so loved? All right, here we go. No, wait, wait, ow, ow, ow. Why don't your attacks hurt them? Ugh. Yeah, Alucard sucks. First off, he gets weapon upgrades like Trevor, which in his case results in those fireballs. You might think that is good as Dracula's were pretty strong, but Alucard is terribly weak. His fire only does half the damage the whip does, and the only way to be on par or better is to have two or three of the fireballs hitting the enemy at the same time. Which isn't easy at all considering you have to be right up to them and having those weapon upgrades at the same time. I mean, sure, I had Sifa and Grant attack from up close, but that was only to kill off weak and fast enemies in one shot, while these guys also had either strong sub-weapons to toss at enemies or strong magic. Alucard, on the other hand, doesn't even have any damaging sub-weapons. I mean, look at this crap! I can't even kill a Medusa head in one blow, which I usually need to do if I'm having a tough time dodging them. So this is the Alucard all you Castlevania fans are creaming about all the time, saying he's like the best character ever. I probably shouldn't be saying that, as I might regret it around the time of Symphony of the Night, possibly. And oh my god, the platforming is very rough in this path. You have all these falling blocks which are very tough to see coming. I mean, sure, I say trial and error, but how many times do I have to die to learn in what order they fall in? Well, fuck this shit. Let's use Alucard's one decent ability. 
turning into a bat. Basically, as much of a terrible fighter as Alucard is, he is amazing for avoiding platforms as he can fly. But that's it really, and to be honest, platforming that is really tough isn't as common as enemies, and so Alucard just isn't worth using on this platforming really. As such, we are back at the Dracula fight, as much as I'd like to have it be son versus father here, I'm not even going to bother with how weak Alucard is, and so it's Trevor versus Dracula. I mean sure I wanted this fight, but it's just so disappointing not to have a reliable partner for this fight. Alucard has basically become that one jock kid who is paired with this nerd kid and lets the nerd kid do all his work. I mean, he is popular like a jock kid too. But regardless, while it is easy enough to reach the final form with Trevor alone, it is as usual the final form that is the real tough battle. Of course, like earlier, I ran out of axes, so I gotta get in close to hit him. However, when I want to hit him, I get beamed. I want to dodge his attack, I still get beamed. I successfully dodge his attack, but I fall into a hole. I successfully hit him, but then he hits me and I bounce backwards as in Castlevania tradition into this shithole here. And this keeps going on and on and on with having to platform to the final battle, fight, lose, and rinse and repeat. <sighs> I haven't felt this defeated since that Castlevania 1 battle with death, and I don't think Holy Water will do much here. I mean, I already did this with Sipa too. I, I just can't seem to do it without her. I'm the obsessive gamer, everyone. I'm that because I love video games, and I put so much of my attention into them. I try to beat any game I play, Unless, you know, they're broken, or they suck, or, well, there might be a lot of reasons, but this might have to be one of those times where I give up. So, this is outside. I mean, it looks fine and such, I guess. I don't get why developers try to make games look like this, as there is, like, trash everywhere. But trying to talk to people is tough. Everyone keeps avoiding me. Sure is different from games. Huh. <sighs> well, real life is a lot harder than I thought it was. I mean, how do people do it all the time? I'm mean, giving my resume to all these people, but no one ever wants me for anything. I mean, sure, I, hope I have one there that I'm like obsessed a gamer for like a few years and just gaming in general for a long time, but how do people do this? I mean, it's almost as if it's harder than Castlevania 3's final boss. Wait, why am I even here then? I should be at home playing Castlevania 3 again. Sure, it's harder, but at least I, it's easier to do. I should be able to do this. You know what, let's go. Right! You know what? It's not about if I can beat this game or not. It's about focusing. Just like how all these people try to focus on their lives and try to get the shit together. Sure, I can be doing that too, but everything sucks less here. So fuck this shit. We're beating this game as planned. As such, after chipping away at Dracula with all of my axes, I leapt to these platforms, stood at the very back of them, and so he beamed at me. I jumped forward to dodge them and landed at the very front of the platform, which then gave me leverage to simply jump up, hit him, and land me back on the very back here. Rinse and repeat and Dracula is dead! The morning sun has vanquished this horrible night. As such, at the end of the game, Alucard finally reveals that he is in fact Dracula's son. To no surprise, but at least he didn't reveal himself to be Dracula all along. Ah, who am I kidding? That plot twist could have been pretty badass. And that's Castlevania 3. I somehow beat this game twice. 
The game is amazing. Yes, I complained a lot, cause, well, it's hard. It's really, really, really hard. And much harder than Castlevania 1. But it is beatable. Just like Castlevania 1, it has continues. And thus, trial and error, you can do it through. Let alone, the game gives you a lot of tools at your disposal, such as these three extra characters, which provide a lot of assistance to defeat the tougher parts of the game. Worried about this platform here? Use Grant to go around it. Falling blocks giving you trouble? Have Alucard fly around them. Dracula being a dick, Sifa's magic does wonders. In fact, I want to go as far as to say that the difficulty, in my opinion, was thrilling. You know how satisfying it feels just to get past the hard parts in this game? By learning through trial and error what is hard and applying that knowledge to the game, it feels good. And of course, this is aside from it being like Castlevania 1, the amazing action platformer it is from its level design that in my opinion is even better here, enemy encounters, and boss battles which are better handled this time around too. It is in my opinion, the true sequel. No broken mechanics like Vampire Killer and Haunted Castle, no stupid confusions and pointless places to travel to like Castlevania 2, a true sequel to Castlevania 1. So yes, this is a very good game. However, if you can't handle hard games, don't push yourself to play it. Play it if you like Castlevania 1, as this does feel like the next step up. Now one final fact. We really got gypped over here. Castlevania 3 was a much better game in Japan. First off, the music quality is so much better. I mean, just listen to the difference here. But the music isn't the only thing. The gameplay was also a bit different in Japan. Each enemy outputs a specific damage output in the Famicom version, while the NES version just outputs more and more as the game progresses, so ours was the more unbalanced game as such. Grant, while fun, was actually very amazing in Japan. He didn't just do a silly little stab, in Japan he threw a fucking dagger, like the badass pirate that he is, as his base attack, mind you. And oh ho ho, the biggest one in my opinion, is if you die against Dracula, you start right at the stairway. Yeah, that's right. No need to do that whole pendulum crap again. Just go and try again with Dracula like in the first game. The list goes on, but it's a much more balanced game, and it really shows that in North America we really had to man it out. I mean, we never even got on this version on Virtual Console. Why? And why did this even happen in the first place? Because Fuck Konami. And that completes the 8-bit era Castlevania games. So everyone, catch part 3 of Castlevania 101, where we move on to the 16-bit era. And that's where the mood sets in, mind you. But everyone, thank you for watching. Hey guys, thank you for watching The Obsessive Gamer. You see that little button over there? You know that one that says subscribe on it? Click it, you know, click it, click it now. For I've got Castlevania Part 2 as scheduled. So everyone, thank you for watching.